we're living in a time of seismic cultural and political shift. Disruptors are more active and more impactful than ever. Today, Apple is going to reinvent the phone, and we are calling it iPhone. The shockwaves challenge our understanding of the world in the face of a relentless drive to invent, innovate, and test the status quo. I think the right way to, to think of things is like, what is the most useful thing that you can think of to do and that others are not doing? What I think is great about technology and every technology that exists is it increases the number of uh, people who can participate. We've made it possible for the ordinary person to participate in that industry. I mean, before this, you had to be an established business and raise money uh, to, to, to be a travel company. Tremors are shaking the foundations of the establishment. We use things like Facebook to share news and um, catch up with our friends, but there, um, they're going to use it to decide what kind of government they want. Because you know what, folks? We're going to take our country back from these people. What they've tried to do is to build a political union without consent, and I've been in there to fight against it. But is change to be feared or embraced? Societal change and cultural change is not always comfortable. Here's what we know. We know that women have 5% of the top jobs in corporate America, and that's not reflective of the population. As somebody who is fascinated by the disruption in the way we consume media, the way we live, the way we work, I saw Uber, of course, as central to this disruption. When Uber comes to a city, it's multiplicative on, in terms of what it does to the transportation services. Can it deliver benefits to society, competition, and consumers? We know customers like low prices, we know customers like big selection, and we know that customers like fast delivery. And so if we can count on those things and we can put energy into them. Bitcoin blasts through the three constituencies of governments, banks, and operators. We're going to see uh, countries that go right to Bitcoin. Can it stimulate a new era of accessibility and opportunity for all? We don't think about producing content for a country. We think about producing content from a country for the world. I'm absolutely sure that streaming will be the dominant way that artists will get paid in the future. The entire music industry is going to be a lot bigger and a lot more healthier than it's ever been. One thing is certain, the frequency of disruption will only accelerate and the implications are huge. We pride ourselves on running the world's largest startup. You know, can you actually be a big company and be flat, be transparent, give lots of autonomy and really enable people to think about how should we be changing? To have a big company that still acts entrepreneurial in nature and that's the key to success. I mean, we, we cannot keep doing what we've been doing and when in the future. We have to change what we're doing. And now, please welcome to the stage three contributors who will now share their personal business, social, and political disruption stories. That was a great applause, thank you. My name's Neil Cross, I'm the Chief Innovation Officer at DBS Bank and recently voted the world's most disruptive CIO. Um, I like to think that's because of my dress sense. Can, I did actually dress up for today. If you ever see me round the bank, I'll be, I'll be worse than this. My entire life has been disruption. I came from a broken home. At the age of 11, I started to write commercial computer games. At the age of 16, I, I retired. I thought that was enough. I've made some money. Um, I, I spent the next 14 years traveling around the world teaching Tai Chi, Xing Yi, Bagua, Kung Fu. And at the age of 30, I thought, well, maybe I'll get a job again. Uh, I spent seven years at Microsoft, ended up running a billion dollar sales business out of Asia. Three years ago, I started DBS Bank. At the same time, every single weekend, I actually set up a social enterprise called Hotel Orangutan in the middle of the Sumatran jungle, where I now live on the weekends. I want to help preserve the orangutans and bring jobs and education to local villagers. I took corporate innovation techniques into the jungle and the jungle simplifies and strengthens. And so those corporate innovation techniques got completely reshaped by jungle villagers. We took them back to the bank, and we have made DBS one of the world's most innovative banks. Last year, we put about 5,000 staff, about a quarter of the bank, through innovation engagements. At the bank, to be a leader, it's mandatory 
for you to do a hackathon and invent your own startup. So it's a mandatory training course. We even have a staff benefit that if you want to be an entrepreneur, we'll pay you $25,000, get you three months off work, and train and educate you to set up your own startup. Somebody in the bank has now got a startup worth 15 million US dollars. And so if you want to come and see how uh, we have completely disrupted not only a bank, but the wider financial services industry, then come and listen to me talk about jungle innovation later today. Thank you. So my name is Robbie Francis and I am the co-founder and director of the Lucy Foundation. I'm also a PhD candidate from the University of Otago in New Zealand. I wanted to begin with a story. I listened to the staff member explain that this institution houses over 300 people with disabilities. 300 people locked in a facility with only two working toilets. Some patients were restrained with drugs, others with ropes and isolation rooms. Violence wasn't tolerated, yet rape was. Everywhere I looked, calloused, withered, disabled humans were sprawled across concrete and dirt. Some patients were naked, lying face down in the wet grass, while others paced frantically, haunted by unseen ghosts. Four years ago, while interning as a human rights monitor, my world was totally disrupted. As I toured what was supposed to be a place of care, I realized that it could have been me. I too am one of a billion people worldwide who identify as disabled, the largest minority in the world, a minority that faces higher unemployment rates, lower levels of education, and less access to adequate health care than any other sector of society. It's called disabilism, the discriminatory, oppressive, or abusive behavior arising from the belief that disabled people are inferior to others. Now, there's a song by a Kiwi singer called Brooke Fraser. She sings, now that I have seen, I am responsible. I am a 28-year-old woman with a disability, and I've seen how people like me are treated. It's my responsibility to respond to the injustice. So upon my return to New Zealand, my friends and I came up with a business model that promotes a culture of inclusivity and accessibility. Named after my prosthetic Lucy leg, the aim of the Lucy Foundation is to disrupt the global coffee industry by creating an entire value chain of coffee that is environmentally, socially, and economically sustainable, as well as inclusive of people with disabilities, from seed to cup. Now today, I stand before you as one woman, one little Kiwi with one leg. On my own, there's only so much that I can do. But now that we have seen, we are responsible. In this room, we are 800 disruptors a global community brought together by the team at St. Gallen to debate and celebrate disruption. Now, my challenge to you is this. How are you going to ensure that your disruptive ideas, your businesses, your enterprises, your communities are accessible and inclusive to all people, regardless of ability or disability? How will you disrupt disabilism? Good morning, San Galen. It's great to be here. Let me tell you my little disruptive story. Two years ago, we decided to start a country. It was something that didn't come out of the blue. Actually, I'm, since my early days, when I started to read books, I, I read a book by Frederick Bastiat, The Law, and it, it, it has deeply influenced me. I, I understood that one of the biggest problems that we are facing on this planet is nothing else but a bad government. You can see how many millions of people have died in the last century just because of the bad decisions. You can see how the world economy is struggling just because the governments are not doing their job very well. So I decided I will dedicate my life uh, to spreading the ideas of liberty, which I believe are the best recipe for economic growth and prosperity. On 13th of April 2015, we did a major step. <laughs> We found a piece of land which was unclaimed by any other country, and we went there and we stuck a flag there. We were just three people at the time, and I was elected president by the other two. <laughs> but 
now we are half a million nation. We are larger than Iceland or, or Malta. We actually have the highest rate of immigration if you consider the size of the land. <laughs> and it's just seven square kilometers. We are the third smallest country on the planet Earth. If we decided to take everybody in, we would be the most densely overpopulated country on the planet Earth. And I think it tells you something. You know, there is a large demand for freedom. Places like Hong Kong, places like Singapore, places like Liechtenstein are great. They are the most prosperous places on the planet. But we've got so much space on this planet. There is millions and millions of kilometers. Why we are not using them that efficiently as the places like Hong Kong and Singapore? So one day when I was traveling in the train, I realized this, that there is all this, all this planet that we can use for the better of mankind. And I can tell you, we would probably be already inhabiting other planets by now if we just had a little bit better governments. So what we decided was to combine the best elements of the, uh, the experience that we had with government so far. We took some elements of the Swiss constitution with some elements of American constitution. We added a little bit of ideas from free private cities and we built Liberland. And I think that's, that's one of the things that it's very true that you cannot change things by fighting the existing reality. You have to build a new model which will make the other things obsolete. So I hope to tell you more at 11 o'clock today and, uh, and see you in, in two hours from now.